in the world of Dark Souls, there aren't many characters who are, are as influential through the entire series as Seath the Scaleless. The aim of this two-part series is to be the most complete analysis of the Pale Drake himself, and to look at the character in the context of all three games, from his life to his soul's reincarnation, and finally his legacy after death. This first video will look at his time as a traitor, a duke, and an unethical researcher. A primordial being of unfathomable intelligence, Seath the Scaleless was an ancient dragon who stood apart from the rest of his race. He was born an albino, his soul tells us this much, and as a result, he was born physically different from his brethren. Whilst they had stone-like scales of immortality, he was pale and soft-skinned, hence his title, the Scaleless. And by being scaleless, he lacked the immortality of his brethren. In addition, the Channeler Helm tells us he was also blind, and he lacked any sort of lower legs or lower body. Instead, he was in possession of three tail-like appendages at the lower half of his body, which, by the time of Dark Souls 2, would earn him the moniker, the Writhing Rune. No doubt, his physical frailty would have made him a second-class citizen in the Age of the Ancients, where his stronger and everlasting brethren would have dominated him. It therefore isn't hard to imagine that an incredibly intelligent being such as Seath would feel envy, hatred and unappreciation in this society. However, soon an opportunity would arise for Seath to take his revenge and reverse his fortunes. For then there was fire, and from the dark came the Lord Souls, and the Lords who formed an alliance to challenge the dragons for dominance of this world. Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, the Witch of Isleth and her Daughters of Chaos, the Grave Lord Nito, and the Furtive Pygmy, the forces of the gods and the human forces of the Pygmy Lords would wage war against the invincible everlasting dragons. The gods and their allies knew the strength of their enemies lay within their scales of immortality, so they had the weapons that pierced their thick scales, such as the dragon slayer arrows. Gwen's lightning bolts peeled apart their stone scales. Nito wasted away their weakened bodies with disease, and the witches burnt down the habitats of the arch trees, whilst the silver knights and the ring knights were sent to the slaughter as fodder. In the recounting of this legendary war, we first get sight of Seath the Scaleless, and we hear that Seath betrayed his own, whilst we observe him crushing a stone scale in his hand before unleashing a scream of anguish, pain and frustration. But how did he betray them? It's never explicitly mentioned in-game, but given the tactics of the insurgents and Seath's obsession with the scales of immortality, it is likely he gave the information to the lords about their secret to immortality. This is in fact confirmed in the comic Age of Fire that he informed Gwyn of the weaknesses of the dragon, but it's up to you if you consider the comics your personal canon. Seath's frustration at what he couldn't have and at being long denied his immortality can be felt in his anguished scream and the way he physically crushes that which he cannot have. Again, this is reiterated in the Age of Fire comic, that he indeed did reveal a secret because he was jealous that they would all outlive him. And so began the Age of Fire, with rule and power being divided amongst the lords. Seath himself was welcome into the Pantheon for his role in the defeat of the dragons. His soul tells us he was made a duke, especially given his royal archives, as well as given a fragment of one of the great lord's souls. The Dark Moon Nightus tells us in a very matter of fact and a direct way as how the duke was elevated. Have you heard of Seath the Scaleless? In legend, 
He turned against the ancient dragons, he became Lord Gwyn's confidant, was granted dukedom, and was allowed to pursue his research. At the Regal Archives, he immersed himself in research on scales of immortality, the one thing that he did not have. Both Frampt and this character, the Dark Moon Knightess, refer to Seath as Gwyn's former confidant, suggesting that Seath could have been close to Gwyn as an advisor, ally, and maybe even friend. Seath had been elevated from a second-class citizen to a duke of the new ruling force with a grand archive of knowledge at his disposal. He had himself a grand library, knowledge at his disposal. But there was something else that he gained from turning upon the dragons. It is something that would grant him a fleeting taste of the immortality that he would chase his entire existence. This was the Primordial Crystal. Logan tells us that he pillaged this ancient treasure when he turned upon the dragons, meaning it was something he took as a spoil of war. And it's certainly another motive as to why he turned on the dragons, to gain this item. The crystal would bless him with a fragile immortality, making him functionally undead. However, this would not be enough for Seath. He wanted true, personal immortality, like that bestowed by the scales he had always lacked. So, armed with power, intelligence, and resource, Seath would begin his lifelong obsession to unlock the secrets of life, and in doing so, he would create a many great works as a byproduct of his research. The Moonlight Greatsword tells us that Seath would become known as the grandfather of sorcery. It was his works that gave birth to magics, a practice which is often associated with the moonlight, much as miracles are associated with Gwyn and the sun. His role as the progenitor of magic is well known throughout the lands. The most famous school of sorceries is the Dragon School of Vinheim. The name of their school is most certainly derived from the dragon Seath, the only dragon actually associated with sorcery. Big Hat Logan was one of the greatest sorcerers of the school, a scholar, and was someone who had a heretical view of atheism. He did not believe in the gods, only reason, and it has allowed him to develop the powerful magics of men to the point where it is now creating spells such as the Soul Spear, said to be on par with the power of the gods. A royal member of the school himself, according to Rickert, he himself, such an accomplished royal scholar, showed deference to Seath the Scaleless, prowess of sorceries, and as such, he came to Lordran to seek Seath's knowledge. Once we rescue him from Sen's fortress, he leaves Firelink Shrine for the Duke's archives, according to Griggs, and this is his reason for coming here. When Logan finally makes it to the archives of Seath, he marvels at the works of Seath and his masterful intelligence. He states, The tomes stored in these archives are truly magnificent, a great pool of knowledge, the fruits of superior wisdom and an unquenchable desire for the truth. Some would say Seath had an unsound fixation, but his work is a beautiful, invaluable resource. All progress demands sacrifice, and I certainly bear no antipathy for that wonderful, scaleless beast. Given Logan's prestige as a sorcerer himself, the man who developed the Soul Spear, powerful and intelligent, Seath actually was since Logan actually recognises his superior wisdom. He mentions Seath's unquenchable desire for truth, which of course is his unquenchable thirst for the secrets of permanent immortality. Logan expresses admiration, but in time this admiration would develop into obsession, and this type of obsession and worship that Seath inspired would still exist countless years into the future, to the very end of time itself. Seath's development of magic 
was clearly a byproduct of his works into the soul and immortality. The description of the homing crystal soul mass learned from his archives says this, the mysteries of souls, crystals, and the sorceries are deeply intertwined. Given that the primordial crystal is what granted Sethus immortality, this explains his research into crystals and thus into sorcery as a byproduct. This shows the clear progression of his work. Magics and crystals contain the secret to the soul, and therefore life, and therefore immortality. Indeed, the crystal breath of Seath curses our life force, again highlighting the connection between mortality and crystals. One of his creations, the crystal golems, are evidently a result of his work trying to draw life and immortality into crystal. For these golems are literally living crystal. Indeed, I see a lot of his creations as a reflection of his never-ending pursuit to the understanding of life, the soul, and immortality. Such as the Moonlight Butterfly, created by Seath from Moonlight Magic, again magic linked to the soul, to create life in his quest to understand how the soul, magics, and immortality are all linked. These creations are Seath's attempt of understanding the mysteries of the soul. Seath hoped to use the power of crystal magic to give him a facsimile of immortality enjoyed by the ancient dragons. If you look carefully at Seath in the opening video, he is very smooth. However, by the time we face him, he is very crystalline, with crystals covering great parts of his body. To me, this is Seath attempting to replicate the scales of immortality. Instead of scales of stone, his scales would be made of crystals that would grant him the same immortality. His obsession for what he never had, the thing that made him feel inadequate, would eventually become an obsession that would drive the blind, pale dragon to utter madness. Logan even implies that his madness and fixation is well known. The unsound fixation on attaining immortality would include kidnap, imprisonment, and the torture of live victims who would become the focus of his unethical research and experimentation. This madness was evidently known to those in Anor Londo. The Dark Moon Nightis says this, But his very research drove him mad. The archives became a dungeon, a place for sinister experiments. Now, nobody dares even approach the Duke's forbidden archives. It looms over this land high atop the mountain. But I should warn against even an approach. We can see that from this line, that Anor Londo and its citizens were clearly aware of the dangers of approaching Seath's realm, and that by maybe by dissuading you from going, she is actually hoping that you will take the bait and rid Anor Londo of their erstwhile ally. The channelers, who served Seath by acting as his eyes that he did not have, would become known throughout the lands as the Snatchers, for they would kidnap suitable humans for Seath's experiments. This is also reflected in the comic Age of Fire, where we see Silver Knights, who are clearly aware of the kidnapping, come to Seath's archives to demand them back. The Grand Archives, once a great library full of unquantifiable knowledge, became a prison. The Grand Archive Key tells us this, The giant cell once imprisoned countless maidens, but is now empty save for a few key persons. They struggle to uphold their sanity, as the horde of mistakes writhe fearfully at close proximity. Now, the key tells us a number of things. Firstly, that this is a makeshift prison that has been filled with experiments as a result of Seath's human experimentation, and that the most suitable for these experiments were maidens. Indeed, the failures that writhe within this prison, the Piscas, were at once themselves maidens of Guinevere. In the prison, we find a number of them weeping, as if for their former selves, and once killed, they drop miracles that were possessed only by the maidens of Guinevere. 
The fact that the Maidens of Guinevere were captured is once again confirmed in the comic Age of Fire, as the knights specifically mention the Maidens of Guinevere. It shows that the Anor Londo authorities were aware of these abductions, but the severity of other events that unfolded after essentially led this to go unanswered. Further evidence that it is Maidens that Seath is taking includes the Maiden set that is found within a corpse in the prison, not to mention the fate of the Maiden Rhea of Thorland if you finish her questline. With all that said, about the obvious, I will now address the elephant in the room. There is another aspect of Seath that some believe inhabit the world of Dark Souls, and this is Priscilla the Crossbeard, a lore point that gets even more complicated if you start to consider Yorshka in Dark Souls 3. There are a lot of theories out there for Priscilla, who she is and who her parents are. Many are reasonable conclusions, given that there is no outright answer addressed in the game. Reading the lore associated with Priscilla from her soul, we learn that she is a crossbreed bastard, and her dagger tells us that she is a dragon crossbreed. She was feared by the gods, and thus locked away in the painted world, feared for her life hunt ability, and for a reason that she was the antithesis of all life. Let's unpack all of this lore. She is a bastard, meaning that she is a child born out of wedlock. She is illegitimate. She is a crossbreed, a combination between two species, in this case a dragon, and then most likely a human or god. For me, Priscilla is another result of Seath's experimentation, part of her coming from his DNA, and then being crossed with a handmaiden, or another god from the royal family themselves. Not only is the Duke the only dragon capable of such a thing, but the life hunt scythe emphasises the fact that she is a stark white crossbreed, much like the albino Pale Drake himself. Using his magic and experimentation, he created this crossbreed as another attempt to unlock the secrets to life and immortality, most likely by seeing what would happen when his flawed dragon DNA was crossed with another species. For me, this is also backed up by the term antithesis to all life, which suggests that she is not a natural form of life, and being created out of Seath's unethical research and experimentation would certainly grant her this title in the kingdom of Anor Londo. Finally, the life hunt Scythe tells us that in the hands of a mortal, it'll turn upon its wielder, yet she can wield this weapon with no problem. This then suggests that she is immortal, and that Seath's experimentation worked. The genetic history of his species' immortality is somehow transferred into this crossbreed. That is all I will say for now on Priscilla without wanting to derail the conversation on Seath Discalus himself. But suffice it to say, alongside the other experiments I've mentioned, I think that Priscilla is another result of this unethical research into life. The fate of these maidens is perfectly illustrated by the writhing and tortured failures. Seath's work took him to a dark place, from a researcher, intellectual, to an unethical madman. He turned his territory from a great place of learning into a dark laboratory. He was desperate and obsessed and would use any means necessary to unlock the secrets of the crystal and immortality. Ultimately, even through his ruthless ambitions, he was unable to achieve true immortality, and we are able to strike the mad beast down after crushing his fragile immortality. Even though Seath loses his body, his legacy of madness and fixation would live on. In the immediate aftermath, Big Cat Logan would fall to madness due to his obsession with the Pale Drake, a type of madness that would come to typify Seath's influence in the ages to come. When we speak to Logan in the archives, he has already begun to become disorientated by the power of Seath's knowledge. Oh, there you are. It's been a while. Or were you just here? This fascinating place defeats my sense of time. 
he does not even have a sense of time, or how long it has been since he last saw us. In a Design Works interview, Miyazaki said this of what happens to Logan after we kill Seath. It is Logan's goal to gain the power of the Ancient's Dragons, so in order to do this, I had an image of him casting off his human clothes. It's similar to using the dragon head or torso stone. You have to remove your equipment. So Logan, an atheist who epitomises cold hard reason over fantasy, is so obsessed with the Pale Drake that he forgoes his life of pragmatism and becomes a naked Seath fanatic. Overwhelmed by the sheer depth of knowledge that came from Seath's work, someone as intelligent and unbelieving as Logan could be driven so mad by the level of this intelligence of this superior being that he would become a worshipper. He would not be the last. And with that guys, that is the end of the first half of my look into Seath. We've now kind of looked at his actual life as the dragon. In the next video, I will look at the next two games. His reincarnation, while he still looks for that which he has never had, as well as his legacy beyond his soul's end. Thanks for watching guys, um, I hope you enjoyed this look at one of my favourite characters and you won't have to wait too long for part 2 of this series. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like this, give me a like, give me a subscribe uh, for the next part is coming and I have plenty of lower souls uh, on my channel.